Wow, Ruan and Johan, thank you very much for that most flattering introduction. I've really been looking forward to this talk, and uh, I must thank you folks for inviting me. I feel it's a real privilege to uh, present to all of you, and uh, good evening too to all the uh, participants. I've been very blessed over the years to have had many killer whale sightings. Um, I spend a lot of time on the water, but a very good network of spotters, uh, fishermen as well, out in the boat, shark cage divers. So whenever killer whales are spotted, um, I'm giving an alert. I'm fortunate I live about uh, three minutes away from my dock, so I can fly down there, and it literally takes me uh, three minutes to get there, another two minutes to start up the boat, and then I'm on the water chasing the uh, killer whales. Uh, besides all the amazing sightings that um, I and my crew and my guests have seen, uh, we've also hosted many scientists, uh, both local and international, who through observation and genetics and acoustic research have expanded the knowledge base uh, quite substantially on the uh, killer whale population of South Africa. Obviously, by interacting with these scientists, we've learned a lot from them as well. So it's a very uh, symbiotic relationship, uh, which we hope will continue for many years to come. I think possibly the most difficult part of this evening is, uh, in, or should I say, in preparing my talk, was what to leave out. I've kept a database of uh, killer whale sightings uh, since 2009, and that database is now sitting at over 400 sightings. So uh, to try and... Uh, go through all of that, we'll be here for uh, ever and a day. So I've decided to uh, whittle it down to uh, False Bay, and even within False Bay, I've decided that I'm going to focus on uh, predatory behavior, all the uh, predators, I mean the uh, predations and the uh, prey on the uh, various uh, prey items that the killer whales have been uh, eating or harassing uh, over the uh, over the years. So uh, without uh, any further ado, let's uh, proceed. Now, prior to uh, 2009, in fact, uh, the 26th of May, 2009, and that's certainly the day that changed my life, there'd been very few reported killer whale sightings uh, inshore along the South African coastline. Um, in fact, so few, in fact, that most or a lot of people didn't believe that we even saw killer whales here in uh, South Africa. And uh, that's quite understandable because I've been boating in False Bay for my whole life. And uh, I've only ever had a brief sighting uh, of a killer whale. In fact, it was back in uh, 1998. And it was literally two killer whales that uh, surfaced in front of my boat. And uh, then they were gone. So uh, on the day when I received the report that uh, there were killer whales uh, predating on dolphins out in the bay, it was certainly a baptism of fire for me. Uh, when I left and uh, had uh, got out to sea, the image that we're looking at now is actually the first sighting that I've had of uh, killer whales uh, predating on uh, in fact, any prey species for that matter, in this instance, uh, common dolphins. Um, it was a full-on attack. Uh, the dolphins were, were, were fleeing, uh, and this whole drama was unfolding in front of me. And uh, frankly, I didn't have a clue what was going on. Um, I kept following the uh, animals and following the action, and uh, then noticed as it developed a little bit further, that there was one female in particular, uh, which was a dominant and the huntress in the uh, group. Uh, there were two other females with her, and then also a young calf. And this female approached the dolphins uh, from behind. As you can see, the uh, killer whales, in fact, very close to the dolphin, maybe uh, 30 or 40 meters, and the dolphins haven't a clue uh, that the killer whale has actually snuck up on them like that. Um, next slide, the killer whale goes in and um, basically identifies one uh, prey item, one, one dolphin, uh, pounces on it, and the rest of the pod just go berserk and flee. Now, uh, 
that one dolphin that was isolated by the uh, single female, uh, they actually, or she and the others, relentlessly chased this animal, uh, battering it, biting it, um, uh, head-butting it, uh, for a full 12 minutes, which I got from the uh, metadata on my uh, camera, until the poor dolphin was just so exhausted and so battered that it just gave up and uh, the uh, killer whale just went in and uh, grabbed the dolphin. Uh, you can see, if you look on the side here, there's quite a few bite marks. Uh, there was quite a lot of blood on the other side of the dolphin as well. But they then dragged the dolphin under the water and uh, shared it with the rest of the uh, pod. I was photographing uh, as I went along, and uh, frankly, I didn't know what I had captured on my uh, camera. It was only when I got home and I started going through my images that I saw what I had and uh, have captured this image, which actually set the world on fire with uh, the uh, drama and of uh, a killer whale predation actually having been uh, recorded. Uh, it was in many newspapers, and I had uh, requests from all around the world. I was now having seen my first dolphin uh, a predation, uh, an expert, if I can use that word, and... Uh, Everybody just wanted to come out and have a look at uh, Killer World, which obviously we couldn't do for them. Uh, we'd only now seen that as our very, very first uh, predation. Uh, we didn't know if we'd ever see it again, but uh, it was a fantastic uh, experience. But uh, we were lucky, and a few months later, uh, Killer Worlds were back in the bay, and uh, you know, we expected, having seen just the one uh, predation, that this would be pretty much routine uh, for killer whales. Like great white sharks, they have the uh, technique of uh, hunting seals, which involves breaching out of the water, and the uh, predation that we saw, the first predation that we saw, was separating a uh, individual, um, wearing it down, and then uh, consuming it and sharing it with the uh, rest of the pod. Uh, but in this instance, we had a few, uh, <clears throat> uh, I think it was also four killer whales swimming along, and uh, we didn't see any prey uh, whatsoever. Uh, suddenly, one of the uh, killer whales just went down, and uh, we saw a whole lot of bubbles coming up to the uh, surface which we subsequently learned that when killer whales bite into prey, they always exhale. So when we're following dolphins, we want to know when they've got their prey item. Uh, as soon as you see the bubbles coming to the surface, you know something's happened uh, down below. A uh, lot of turmoil. Obviously, it takes no time whenever there's a predation for a cape gull to uh, come and uh, eat scraps that uh, fall off the... Uh, animal as they're uh, eating it and uh, with all the turmoil in the water uh, we suddenly saw a plume of blood coming up with uh, some more bubbles and then on the surface a slick and uh, lots more blood. Now we didn't know what animal the uh, killer whales had predated on. Uh, with hindsight now many many years of experience uh, and obviously the area that they're in um, I would guess it would probably have been either a seven-gill car shark or possibly a bronze whaler shark. We didn't see any seals swimming around uh, before, and uh, also we didn't see any uh, dolphins in the area either. Then the following year, um, again, we had uh, our killer whales in the bay, and this was the first pod that we saw back in 2009. Uh, the approach uh, to the predation was exactly the same as we saw in 2009. I had my camera set up, and I was expecting a, uh, a very, very similar strategy, but uh, I was totally surprised. I'd had my camera set on uh, manual focus, and uh, suddenly this killer whale just leapt out of the water and dived straight into the uh, pod of the dolphins. Um, my camera didn't have time, or I didn't have time to uh, focus the camera, and I had, was left with this heartbreak shot. Now, any photographers amongst you um, will all have shots or photographs like this, but uh, luckily when I went to bed that night, uh, when I closed my eyes, I could see exactly what had happened, uh, absolutely uh, pin sharp.
And uh, also something uh, very interesting we, uh, we saw back in 2009 is that all young killer whales need to be taught how to hunt. And uh, this is done by demonstration generally by the uh, matriarch. And uh, within the same group, as I mentioned, there were the three females and the calf. Um, the calf had been following the females, especially the uh, one that we felt was a matriarch, certainly the huntress, and um, observing what she was doing. And then almost um, as, as you would teach a, uh, a young child to do something, they were approaching uh, dolphins and the uh, matriarch moved back and let the youngster go in first and uh, see how well he would, uh, she would do with the uh, predation. So off the youngster went, arrived at the dolphins, the dolphins went berserk as they uh, usually do, but the youngster chickened out. He turned back and ran to, uh, to his mommy and uh, the dolphins swam off. And I think we spent probably about 20 minutes on the boat just laughing our heads off. At, uh, at this incident. Now, uh, the picture that I used for the title, uh, this actually happened the following day to this uh, youngster learning uh, how, to, uh, how to predate on dolphins. And uh, it appeared as if the uh, killer whales had found a case of Red Bull the night before. And uh, these guys were on a Red Bull high the next day because uh, what I witnessed that day, I've never witnessed before, uh, most of the uh, predations were aerial predations, and uh, it was just quite, quite epic. And uh, here are a few images. Um, the first set is actually uh, just my motor drive or my uh, sequence of uh, the attack that you've seen, with the killer whale launching itself into the air, plummeting or plunging down onto the uh, dolphins, uh, getting one in its mouth as it comes down, disappearing with a big splash, and that was the end of the uh, dolphin. About 40 minutes later, and this is quite interesting, this is another female uh, in a similar position. For those of you who know, um, who know the area, we've got uh, Musenberg in the background. Uh, she approaches the dolphins from behind and again just dives in there and uh, takes the... Uh, one of the dolphins out. Um, later on in the day, uh, we had this uh, female again. She literally headbutted that um, dolphin out of the water, and then in the next frame, just came straight down onto it, and uh, the dolphin was literally killed in a uh, in a second. It just continued and continued. And um, throughout that period, they were actually almost taking turns um, in, uh, in, in predating on the dolphins. And quite interesting, I kept a, a, a time of it. It literally happened at 40 minute intervals. So they would kill a dolphin, uh, they would share the food, they're very much like uh, wolves, uh, all the uh, prey items is uh, equally shared, and uh, then they'll move on. But in the meantime, the dolphins would maybe be about three or four miles away. Uh, the killer whales would just gently follow them and then suddenly uh, group up and then uh, they would go in again for another uh, predation. And what was particularly interesting about um, this day, in fact, this week in uh, particular, is that um, a lot of folk are associating um, the disappearance of great white sharks with the presence of uh, killer whales. Now, it certainly appears in this um, with uh, two killer whales, Port and Starboard, which we'll uh, talk about later. But the dolphin hunting killer whales do not um, displace the great white sharks at all. Uh, during this period, we had the O Search vessel here. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the research that they've done where they've uh, caught sharks with a uh, hook and line and they drill um, satellite tags into their uh, dorsal fin, actually quite brutal uh, in my own opinion, and then um, they would track the sharks from then. 
Uh, we were about a mile away from uh, Seal Island, which you can see in the background, whilst they were doing it. But there were also three shark cage diving operators uh, operating at Seal Island at the time. And with all this predatory behavior, they all had very good sharks on that day. So um, certainly for this uh, dolphin hunting pair, uh, they didn't or uh, don't displace the, uh, the great white sharks. Now, uh, we've watched different strategies with, uh, with killer whales. And the one that really uh, blows my mind is uh, this little dolphin. Uh, they've been chasing it for quite some time. And it was a wily little fella. And they just couldn't get the thing. They couldn't nail it down. And uh, then suddenly what happened is one of the uh, females started swimming alongside the dolphin, making herself highly visible. She then left out the water and overtook the dolphin uh, as if heading off into the distance. And in true decoy style, another one came up from behind and nailed the dolphin without it and knowing what it actually hit it. And uh, that is really... Uh, super clever cooperative uh, hunting. We've also found that the uh, killer whales they hunt dolphins at night, uh, not only during the day, which was uh, quite interesting uh, to uh, learn at that stage. In fact, it was quite funny. We went out, it was incredibly dark. Uh, the killer whales went into the dolphins and the dolphin group split up into two and we followed the wrong group. So uh, we got the initial uh, attack, but that was uh, all we saw. Um, besides the um, dolphin hunting uh, killer whales, uh, we don't know with the South African killer whale population like they do in the uh, Northeast Pacific, whether our killer whales are actually specialist feeders uh, or general feeders. You know, over in, uh, in, in, in the Northern Pacific, you've got distinct pods that only feed on fish, and you've got uh, which are called uh, residents, and you've got transients, which feed off uh, marine mammals. We don't know, and we are a little bit cautious at this stage uh, to categorize our uh, killer whales. But this pod uh, that we encountered actually in Buckles Bay, this was back in 2015, uh, was during the peak yellowtail snook and squid season. And uh, they display characteristic fish having behavior, I mean, fish eating behavior. Uh, there were larger pods, I think there were about 18 or 19 in, in total. And uh, they usually swim in formation. Um, they circled the Buffalo's Bay area uh, for literally the, uh, uh, I would say, five or six hours. And every now and again, they would just charge into uh, what we could only presume would be either a school of. Uh, yellowtail or um, snook or uh, maybe even uh, squid for that matter. Um, <clears throat> also characteristic with uh, fish eating uh, killer whales, lots of tail snapping. And uh, they do this to stun the fish. Uh, they'll go into a uh, show the school of uh, bait fish, they'll slap their tail, they'll stun a few of them, and then they'll circle back and uh, chomp them as they go. They do this with the uh, herring in, uh, in Norway. It's been very well documented there. Uh, one thing we've also seen here is that uh, seals aren't on uh, killer whales uh, menu and uh, seals definitely don't regard killer whales as uh, being predators. Uh, here we've got a seal. You can see its rear flippers up in the air and it's eyeball to eyeball with that uh, killer whale, and the killer whale just absolutely ignored it. So uh, lucky for that seal, uh, it uh, didn't realize what uh, danger it was in. And then we get to uh, Port and Starwood, which everybody has uh, been fascinated with. Uh, they're either famous or infamous, depending on uh, which standpoint you look at them from, but uh, there are two uh, incredible uh, animals. And uh, they were first uh, seen back in 2009, um, but they were only seen in False Bay for the first time in 2015. Uh, in 2014 was the first time we actually got an idea that uh, something strange was happening in the bay. 
and it was happening mainly in the uh, kelp beds uh, just at Miller's Point, in the exact uh, same spot that the uh, Port and Starboard are entering now uh, in front of the uh, Cape Boat and Ski Boat Club. Uh, the scuba divers uh, were finding a lot of dead seven-gill uh, car shots, and almost surgically they had their uh, livers removed. Uh, at first we thought maybe it was uh, fishermen taking them for bait. Um, killer whales weren't really uh, uh, con considered. Uh, but uh, as I said, we saw uh, Port and Starwood back in 2015 uh, in False Bay. I actually named them then uh, with the uh, port having its uh, dorsal fin uh, flopping over to the left hand side and starboard uh, to the right. So, being a nautical man, I use the uh, nautical term to describe the two. Also, makes uh, reciting the animals uh, very easy. Uh, in 2016, Dr. Alison Cocker, after we had found some, after the divers had found some more uh, seven gills, uh, then did a necropsy. And uh, then she found uh, tooth impressions on their pectoral fins. And uh, she could then uh, say categorically uh, that that's the result of a uh, killer whale predation. They didn't stop with the uh, seven gill car sharks. Uh, they went on and uh, five great white sharks were washed up in uh, Hans Bay back in 2017 uh, with exactly the same wounds. In 2019, uh, in Seal Island, there were 10 predatory events, mainly on uh, bronze whalers and, uh, and seven gills. And uh, these animals had entrenched themselves along uh, our coast between uh, False Bay and uh, a little bit up the East Coast. And they were targeting uh, various shark species uh, in shore. Uh, but besides what we initially saw up to 2009, as you'll see in a short while, uh, it certainly didn't end there. Just to give you a little bit about a history about uh, Port and Starboard, um, they were first seen um, in January of 2009 uh, up in Luderitz, and their range extends from Luderitz all the way to uh, Port Elizabeth, and that's an area of about or a distance of about 970 uh, nautical miles, which is a huge distance, but not really for, uh, for killer whales. If we take their average swimming speed of uh, five knots, it'll actually only take them eight days to get from uh, Luderitz all the way through to uh, Port, uh, Port Elizabeth. As I mentioned, when I started, I've got about 400 odd uh, records of killer whales uh, since 2009. Uh, Port and Starboard are the most recited animals, and uh, they've been seen more than 65 times um, since uh, that time. And uh, what's interesting with all the, uh, all the uh, um, dates and the records that we have, we're now starting to see a little bit of a trend emerge. So we can anticipate where they'll be next, and uh, hopefully... Uh, the shark, uh, or shall I say, the shark operators can uh, prepare for them. We always thought that uh, Port and Starboard were, why is it not showing you? Uh, we always thought that Port and Starboard were animals that uh, were only uh, two brothers that uh, went out on their own and uh, they were perhaps outcasts from a uh, larger pod kicked out for some reason, uh, but that's not the case. And it's not unusual for killer whales, especially males, uh, to leave the matrilineal uh, pod. They'll go off and they'll look for mates or for breeding and uh, also just wander off for a while. And uh, I think this is perhaps why or, or, or they discovered, or when they discovered, uh, that there are plenty of... Uh, sharks inshore for them to uh, predate on and uh, they started uh, making a little bit of a habit of it. They're not the only two uh, animals with uh, collapsed dorsal fins. There's another um, killer whale. Let me just take a sip. <clears throat> also with the dorsal fin knocked uh, over to the left and uh, he's been uh, called Lefty, we really are quite creative with the uh, names. 
And uh, we've also seen <clears throat> here we've got port with another uh, killer whale. In fact, uh, this animal's lost the top of its dorsal fin. I've only ever seen that animal once, uh, but quite interesting at the time to see uh, port and starboard uh, with another animal with a damaged uh, dorsal fin. They even had some uh, penguins in the picture too, which was uh, rather cool. Now, besides the sharks that um, Port and Starboard had been uh, predating on, um, we then saw um, some interaction with uh, sunfish. Uh, one day we were following Port and Starboard towards Cape Point. <laughs> you can see the uh, shadow of the two of them in the water here. And uh, they came up behind the sunfish, which uh, breached. Uh, we didn't see whether they ate um, the, the, the sunfish or not, uh, but that's when we got the first inkling that uh, perhaps it's not only the uh, sharks that they were eating, uh, but perhaps uh, they were predating on uh, Mola Mola as well. And then we, uh, I think, oh, this has gone all funny now. Um, and then in 2020, we had uh, Port attack a uh, molar molar right next to our boat and consume the uh, fish. So uh, <coughs> at that stage, we were convinced that now uh, these killer whales were not only uh, eating the uh, shark species, but they were eating the uh, molar molars as well. Uh, first time we actually witnessed them uh, attacking a shark, uh, this was uh, back in uh, 2009, uh, in May, just off uh, Partridge Point. Uh, we saw some uh, typical activity, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when they're swimming along and they go under the water and we see a plume of bubbles come to the surface, you know they've put me to something. And here Port brings a, uh, a uh, copper shark up to the surface holding it uh, just ahead of its uh, pectoral fins and uh, literally like a uh, <clears throat> cowboy will flick a whip, uh, port, flick this uh, um, uh, shark and uh, that's obviously how it extracted the, uh, the shark's liver, which uh, the whole incident lasted literally seconds and uh, the two of them uh, moved off. But it was great to have uh, documented it uh, but it didn't come anywhere near to what was documented last year. You've probably all seen it, um, both uh, on Discovery Channel and around the world. Um, a uh, pot of killer whales, uh, including, in fact, it was five killer whales, uh, but that included a starboard, uh, attacked a uh, great white shark, and this um, up in Mossel Bay, and this was documented uh, both by a drone cameraman there and also a drone photographer and also uh, from a helicopter. It's the first uh, record of a uh, predation on a great white shark uh, taken. Phenomenal footage. Uh, you can see there they've got it as the uh, killer whale had uh, bitten into the, uh, into the shark. And uh, <clears throat> it probably one of the most incredible natural history or natural uh, history moments uh, that have been recorded. Uh, the Great Whites fled from the area for a period of about uh, seven weeks after that. And uh, we also believe that two or possibly three uh, Great White Sharks were predated on uh, over the period that the uh, film took place. Uh, we had the drone uh, photographer there we also had a, a helicopter pilot who was doing uh, little flips. So he was going backwards and forwards to the uh, killer whales. Uh, I actually took all the uh, footage and spliced it together in a time sequence. And then an uh, incredible paper uh, was uh, published by a PhD candidate uh, called Alison Tama. Uh, you can look that up. It's certainly worth uh, reading. Uh, if you can't find it online, you can just drop me an email and I'll send you a uh, copy of that um, paper. It's well worth re uh, reading and it's certainly quite a novel uh, uh, bit of science. Uh, Port and Starboard, um, 
are just, as I said, uh, continually going up and down the coast. And it appears that each time they're hunting, especially on the smallest shark species, uh, the numbers are rising. Uh, these pictures that uh, are in the background was taken last week in uh, Hans Bay, uh, that was on Sunday, and a total of 197 gill cow shots uh, washed up. And that was as of the 27th of uh, February. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they uh, predated on a few more. So that was uh, quite, the, so I had quite an event there um, up the West Coast. Uh, they've been uh, sighted since uh, of the 12-mile reef in uh, Strays by that was this uh, morning. Um, I don't think they've been to Falls Bay in the last while um, because there's still plenty of seven gills and uh, copper sharks uh, swimming around the bay. My friends who do the uh, shark cage diving obviously don't want to see them in the bay and uh, I'm happy for them that uh, we're getting reports that uh, they see plenty of uh, copper sharks on their tours. Uh, one thing that I really do enjoy doing, uh, but in, in, besides uh, obviously just watching the uh, killer whale, is uh, hosting scientists on, on board. Uh, they gather a huge amount of data, uh, spending time with us, and uh, we learn an enormous amount uh, from them and uh, we've been fortunate to be able to uh, get out there and uh, take my OPSI samples. Here you can see uh, the OPSI samples taken with either a crossbow or gas-fired uh, gun. Uh, you've got an arrow with a little bit of foam and a uh, small uh, uh, tube at the uh, pointy end. It just takes a little bit of skin, just a little slug. Uh, the foam compresses, the arrow uh, bounces out, and then the uh, scientists will uh, gather the little um, sample. You can see it there on a bit of uh, foil, and uh, they can learn an enormous amount uh, from those uh, genetic uh, samples. Uh, they can tell the sex, the abundance, the relationship between the uh, various uh, pods, uh, diets, and it just goes on and on. So it's very, very valuable uh, information that they can get from such a tiny sample. Uh, we're also lucky we managed to get uh, biopsy samples of both uh, port and starboard. Um, they're actually at, uh, those samples are with a uh, world expert at uh, Durham uh, University, uh, Prof. Uh, Hulzel and uh, he's actually busy analyzing them. We look forward to uh, seeing a full report from, uh, from him. Now, interesting, over the years, uh, we obviously uh, try and document and uh, identify individual whales. I mean, killer whales, is, uh, we see them, and we do that by taking photographs of their dorsal fin, and then we can go through our records every time uh, they're sighted, and uh, here you've got the same animal that between 2014 and 2020 had been sighted five times. It's actually been uh, sighted subsequently as well, but I just haven't updated uh, this image yet. And you can see Nisner, Falls Bay, Mossel Bay, Offshore Cape Point, and uh, Port Elizabeth. So we're getting an idea of uh, their range. And in this case, uh, they've been documented between Cape Town and uh, Port Elizabeth. Uh, further on either side, I'm sure they've been there, uh, but we've got very good eyes on the water from Cape Town all the way up to uh, Port Elizabeth. Not only the whale watching operators and the shark cage divers, uh, but uh, a very, very uh, good network of uh, spotters from the land and uh, apps like uh, Safari and uh, WhatsApp groups that whenever animals are spotted, uh, we're alerted to them, and obviously so is everybody else, so we can all enjoy these animals. Uh, we've also seen over the years that uh, it's not all fun for these animals. They uh, do uh, <clears throat> carry some serious battle scars. Uh, here's a male that's obviously uh, been run over by a ship. Uh, its dorsal fin's been very badly damaged, and you can see the uh, tail flukes as well. Um, have both of them have been uh, chopped, obviously, uh, by a propeller uh, during the uh, same incident. 
And also killer whales, they tend to uh, bite each other. Here you can see some uh, tooth marks and uh, there's some impressions on the front of the dorsal fin. And then there were some very clear rate marks on the uh, other side of the animal. So even though they're uh, matrilineal family groups that appear to get on very well together, they obviously uh, have their disagreements from, uh, from time to time. We had a very interesting animal here um, a few years ago, uh, which was named Etty after the uh, lady in the net who spotted it for the first time here in uh, Paul's Bay, a male with a uh, rather bent uh, dorsal fin. And uh, it spent over a month in this pink area. And uh, at first we didn't know whether the animal was sick or what the purpose was, uh, but there's quite an abundance of uh, sunfish and uh, this animal was obviously uh, alone or felt like being alone for a while. Uh, and as I said, uh, spent a month in an area barely five miles when uh, these animals can uh, travel well over 100 kilometers in a day. Uh, we followed it for a while. We didn't want to harass the animal too much. Uh, but on one occasion, we uh, saw Eki actually take a uh, sunfish uh, which dragged down under the water, it was eating it, and a very lucky seal got to uh, share in the spoils. Here you can see the uh, seal eating a length of the uh, molar molar's uh, intestine. Uh, where do we go from here? Uh, but besides all the, uh, you know, brutal attacks that we see uh, with killer whales. One thing that I really do get an enormous amount of pleasure from is actually just seeing a uh, happy and a healthy and a stable family group, just interacting and bonding with each other. And, uh, you know, especially with males, uh, with females, with uh, sub-adult females, and uh, a calf amongst them as well, swimming very closely together and just enjoying each other's uh, company. And also, you know, they always present themselves for a nice photograph from time to time. Uh, this animal was approaching us. We saw the lighthouse in the background and just had to wait a couple of minutes until it lined up and uh, snapped as a rather interesting uh, picture. But one thing that also uh, never ceases to amaze me about uh, Killer World is the family bond. And every time they will be hunting and they'll kill something. Uh, they'll always exchange a little morsel of food between them after the main, or should I say, the main course has been uh, shared. And uh, this little morsel can be the size of an olive. And here we've got a young killer whale. And if you look in its mouth, there's a tiny piece um, of the remains of a dolphin. And uh, that animal swam up to one of the adults and delicately passed that piece of meat over to uh, another animal, swam alongside for a while, and then uh, swam off. So uh, their bonds are incredible, and their demonstration of it uh, is also quite amazing. So uh, thank you, and I hope you enjoyed what you saw. I'm going to hand over to you, Han, who will um, uh, begin or handle the question and answer session. But I, Yuan, before you start, I have a question here. Um, uh, do you know, uh, Dave, why Port and Starbird were rejected from their pod? Um, I don't believe they were rejected. Um, I think they just decided to go and explore, like, to... Uh, young brothers would or uh, brothers would and I think uh, possibly going off uh, looking for mating opportunities on one of the documentaries that I did uh, I had a professor uh, Barrett, Lance Barrett Leonard from uh, Columbia or from uh, from um, Canada on, on board and uh, they followed their pods in fact their killer wells were almost over researched they know what they're doing every minute of the day and often they'll find a couple of males will go off for up to three months and then they'll rejoin the, uh, the pod again. But uh, also quite interesting is that I've noticed that when Port and Starboard have been seen inshore, uh, 
it's often coincided with seeing other pods or larger animals or larger pods slightly offshore. So maybe they've just learned to come inshore and uh, find their liver pantry uh, amongst the kelp beds and the others are sticking <laughs> the long line. Lovely. Oh, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, I appreciate your answer. Uh, Johan, the screen's all yours, and Marty already has his hand up. So, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Um, welcome, everybody, to the question and answer session of the evening. You're most welcome to either ask your question in the chat if you are shy, but please don't be shy. Please use the reaction tools at the bottom of the screen and um let us know when you're ready to ask a question marty i was wondering about the photo that you're going to use tonight and that is not a whale it's a, it's a good try but um you're going to have to visit false bay or armanis or somewhere like that so you can um work on your photo collection marty you're welcome to ask your question Cool. Uh, thanks, Dave, for the talk. Um, I'm in pitch darkness with load shedding as per usual, so uh, <laughs> that's why I'm turning on my uh, camera. But uh, yeah, I'll probably look like a whale without my t-shirt on. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thanks, uh, Dave, for the excellent talk. I I've got a couple of questions. I have a reputation for that, so sorry. But um, yeah, I'm just amazed. I mean, the, 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 that one photograph that you um, showed with the small seal pup busy eating i think you called it a bolo bolo uh mola mola or something the, the, That's right, the yeah, same picture. Yeah. um right next door i mean surely that seals in huge <laughs> danger of just getting slicked as well or is that not on the dietary requirements for the whale you know it's not on the on on their diet um i've only seen two seals being killed by a killer whale uh, that's one thing I left out of my um, out of my documentary. I mean, out of my talk is that um, on the one day, Port and Starboard actually killed six sunfish in under an hour. Sure. Uh, I don't know what they the, what they were on that day, but uh, they actually mm -hmm. swam past two seals, um, and they bit them, killed them, and swam off. They didn't eat them, but I think those seals were just getting a little bit. Uh, cheeky or they were uh, perceived to be a little bit cheeky but that's the only time i've seen the killer whales actually uh killing a seal but i've never seen them eating a seal okay cool and then um just as far as uh, again the same those penguins are also extremely close on that one photograph that you shared i was amazed to see them um so close so i guess that they also don't like poultry <laughs> there you are they, they they also don't see the killer whales as a uh as a predator, I seem to think that killer whales are seen by penguins and by seals uh, in the same light as they'd look at a Brutus whale, a non-threatening uh, species. Okay, cool. And then uh, on the sharks, is it literally just their liver that they, they're eating? I mean, as you said, there's a whole lot that they killed. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the liver carries all the energy. A uh, liver or on a great white shark uh, will probably weigh a third of its body mass. Wow. And with the lipids and oil, the amount of uh, nutritional value there is uh, is huge. The rest of the shark um, is really, there's not much uh, nutritional value there, but also the uh, shark skin has got denticles, which is like sandpaper. So if the uh, killer whale was to chew on the skin, it would actually wear their teeth down, even though there are killer whales, and I would suspect that port and starboard, they are what we call the flat tooth variety. And I think if they uh, if they ate the uh, skin, it would definitely accelerate the uh, tooth wear. And, and then the the dolphins is it also the same thing? Just the livers, or do they? Because that one photograph, it almost looked like a snake that was slicking in a frog. You know, it was just the tail that was sticking out of its mouth. Um, yeah. I mean, do they almost swallow the thing whole, or was that a piece that it was just looking like that on the photo? You know, again, we've got a skeleton of a dolphin that we pulled out the water after killer whales have eaten it, and it looks like this animal has been butchered by a uh, an accomplished German butcher. In that, <laughs> it was literally just the bone the bone left. Uh, these animals with their teeth, I, I don't know how they do it, 
Uh, but that, they, they eat most of the meat on the uh, on the dolphin. You know, any predator will usually go for the organs first uh, because that's got the most uh, uh, nutritional value, and then the meat and the muscles after that. But uh, generally, they'll eat most of the dolphin. Yeah, and then uh, last question: How many dolphins at a time? Because I mean, this is almost like um, you know mass feeding frenzy and then you know do they not eat then for a while or is this uh, every day um i think they're probably hunting them every every day if you look at a killer whale weighing in at about six tons uh and even a, a, a group of four of them um i would say that when they were hunting like that one day in 2012 we were literally watching one predation every 40 minutes yeah. so i reckon in the so the five or six hours that we spent with them, they probably uh, consumed about seven dolphins. It's incredible. Thanks for the talk. Very interesting. Great. Thank I'll, you. I'll stop now. <laughs> <laughs> if I may, uh, Johan, just before we go on, Marty, I don't know. I, I, I'm, apologies if I'm, uh, but and Dave, you can you can just affirm this, but uh, a sunfish, mola mola. I mean, uh, it, it, it's quite it's quite a large fish. I mean, I don't know if they were juveniles or not, but I mean, if they were fully grown adults, it's 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 quite a big fish. <laughs> it's not it's so... the largest of the uh, bony fish. They can get yes. up to two tons, as you know, yes. and uh, they're actually the only warm-blooded fish, as a matter of uh, as a matter of just the uh, sunfish that also then predate on would probably have a disc size of about one and a half meters. Mm. It's a platter for four. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> one day, one day we'll have um, uh, oh, maybe maybe one of the talks we'll have Professor Van Us talk about the uh, the special uh, symbiosis between sunfish and um, seabirds when it comes to parasites on the yes. uh, on their skins. But yeah, lacquer. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting, okay. Leslie. Thanks, Ron. Okay, Bye. Leslie. Sorry, you've been waiting for quite some time. Please go ahead. Thank. You. Thank you, and thanks for a, a great talk. That was so interesting. Um, I don't know whether it's fake news or not, but there seems that there's been reported attacks of killer whales on small boats off Europe. Um, is there anything like that that has been reported in you know in, in our shores? Thanks. Um, no, uh, Lizzie, we haven't had it reported here. And uh, what you're referring to is what's been happening off uh, Portugal uh, and mainly with yachts. And uh, what was happening is that the killer whales were following the yachts. And uh, obviously, uh, there's a lovely uh, vortex coming off their rudders and they were biting at the rudders and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, damaging the uh, vessels quite quite badly. So it has become a bit of a problem there. They're not actually ramming the boats as, as such. I think they're just playing with anything that's uh, sticking out of the out of the boat. And it's very difficult to stop a yacht. I've been chatting to the uh, scientist um, in Portugal who's been dealing with uh, um, uh, managing uh, this issue. And, uh, you know, a power boat, you can always stop it dead and turn the engines off and uh, the killer whale's not going to come and play with your boat. But uh, we have, uh, for instance, when we're filming or we're uh, tracking dolphins or killer whales, we have what we call our dolphin speed, which is about five knots. And that's very similar to the speed that a yacht will uh, travel at. So I think the killer whales are following the yacht, seeing that long stayed rudder in the water, and they just can't resist biting at it. Oh. Thanks. And, and can I ask another question, please? Um, sure. your, your, what, what camera did you use and what lens? Because some of your photographs were so sharp. I'm really envious. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I think that's me now. Yeah, no, I've used a few cameras uh, through the, the early uh, ones was the Nikon D90. And then I went to the Nikon D810. And I currently use the Nikon D850. And uh, the lens that I use uh, isn't the greatest of quality lens, but it's a very good quality lens, but it's got a very good range. And it's a 28 to 300 millimeter. So if an animal's right next to my boat, 
or sight distance away, I can always have the range uh, to capture it properly. Uh, we often have people coming on our boat, uh, I won't say from which country, <laughs> but they come with 500 millimeter <laughs> telephoto lenses, which are great for birds, but they're uh, not good on a boat. And then uh, they're very disappointed when you've got a well next to the boat and uh, they can only maybe uh, get about one inch of the uh, skin in their frame because they've got such a powerful lens with them. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Andrew, please go ahead. Andrew, you can just you need hear to... me, Dave? Yes, I can. You hear me, Dave? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, just to link up on what the first of all, thank you very much for the great talk. It's very scintillating and uh, very impressive. Thank you. Just to link back on what Marty said. Um, the killer sharks. Uh, understandably, correct me if I'm wrong, the killer sharks are a, a brother, if I may say, or a family of the dolphins. Why do they like them so much? Uh, why do they like them as a prey item? Okay, that, 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 that um, oh, because, okay. Uh, you know, the energy that a killer whale requires in order to live. You know, most mammals, we, we need about 2% of our body weight per day um, uh -huh. to sustain ourselves. So, um, you know, because I've also, and, and it's a good question that I've always wondered, why don't killer whales uh, attack seals for that, for that matter? They, well, they, for, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they do, obviously, in Patagonia and, and other parts of the world, they've specialized on on it, but uh, in South Africa, um, they don't. And I think they're really, um, there's abundance of larger prey items that will give them the energy that they require. Okay. The other thing, uh, just to link up on that again, uh, why do we have so many of them here in our southern shores? Well, is it, is it like that in other countries? Or is it because we have so much prey for them to to eat. Okay, well, killer whales are found worldwide. You'll find them from pole to pole in, 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 in every ocean. Um, there aren't so many in South Africa. I reckon there's probably only about 350 killer whales along our coast. Uh, I think traditionally they would feed offshore. Uh, oh. they're, they're also no, uh, um, uh, um, known to uh, depredate off longline fishing boats. Um, perhaps we've overfished our oceans and they need to move inshore to look for, uh, for prey items. And that's why we've seen more and more of them. But we see the same pods over and over again. So I would say that uh, if our killer whale population was about 400, that would be a lot. Oh, OK. Thanks, Thanks Dave. Thank you. Thanks. Dave, it's your turn. Please go for it. Hi, Dave. Yeah, I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, we're only one bay apart, and geez, absolutely amazing that you've the, the footage that you've got over the last what 13 years, 13, 14 years. So yeah, just keep up the good work. Uh, I am totally impressed, just like I think everybody else is. <laughs> um, and I'm on my bucket list. Yes, I, I've managed to see uh, orcas in. Uh, in uh, Walker Bay on two occasions in 20 years. It was okay. once was port, port and starboard. Yes. And then I got a super pod or herd of about 15, which I would gladly like to send to you. And maybe you can you know, identify them. Maybe you haven't seen them. I'd love to see it. And uh, my question to you actually is, um, how many have you documented already with the, with the flukes and the, and the uh, dorsal fins? Uh, you know, David, that's very much a uh, work in progress. Um, I've been a little bit slack on that. Um, I've got, I, I record the data very, very uh, thoroughly, but um, to go through and look for, uh, or shall I say, for individuals, um, I think I was at about 150, 160 at the last count. 
Uh, and then I started getting to the females, which had no, had no uh, uh, little nicks and, uh, and uh, chunks out of their dorsal fin. It made it very, very difficult uh, to identify. And I thought at that stage, what I need to do is find a very willing, uh, either a master's candidate or whatever, to take it on as a project. But uh, at this stage, I'm still under 200 of animals that I've uh, identified, and that's out of 400 scientists. I think I'd probably get, I estimate I'd get to about 300 on what I've got. Oh, okay, fantastic. Um, yeah, just to finish off, I don't have any more questions. Just keep up the good work. Thank and you. then to, uh, to Johan and uh, Chris and Marit and Ruan, my apologies for not uh, saying good evening this, this, this evening. So, yeah, I haven't forgotten about you guys either. And Dave, once again, thank you very much. Thank you. That's our sitting darkness. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy, Dave. Enjoy the fire. Thank you, um, Jan. I'm, I'm sure we have a few representatives of universities in the in this evening. So um, any masters or PhD students out there who are looking for a project, there you have it. Um, please get in touch with Dave. He might want to share his photographs with you. Um, then Ciel, please ask your question. Ciel's from Kenya. Hi, Dave. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you. That was such a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, just a really quick question for me. Is there any reason um, that causes them their dorsal fins to collapse like port and starboard that you know of? Um, killer whales in captivity all have collapsed dorsal fins. Uh, killer whales in the in the wild, depending on the population, uh, it's between sort of point or oh, 0.7 percent uh, up to about five and a half percent will have uh, collapsed dorsal fins, and uh, it could be injury, it could be illness, it could be exposure to pollutants, it could be nutritional um, stress. Uh, we don't really know. No, why? I know that as killer whales get older, the um, dorsal fins get a little bit floppier. Uh, in fact, they tend to get, you'll see in some of our pictures, uh, they get a little bit uh, wavy and then they get a little bit uh, a little bit floppy with age. There's no muscle or bone in a dorsal fin. It's all collagen. Uh, so it's all connective tissue. So uh, I think it's probably uh, either trauma or... Uh, or, or stress or pollutants or that type of thing. We don't know exactly why. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Cyril. Uh, Marty, I see your hand is up. I just need to turn to the um, chat a little bit because there are a whole heap of questions there that, that needs to uh, be answered. Um, a question from a TUT student, Blaine van der Spey. Um, and this is perhaps an important subject for you to address, Dave. I've heard that killer whales will kill for pleasure. How valid is that? How do you address that? Well, killer whales play with their food. Um, they'll always consume what they, what, what, what they eat, but they will play with it. Um, I would say that the playing with their food is probably demonstrating and training their young. Uh, you'll see this particularly in Patagonia with um, seals uh, that they actually uh, hunt right on the shoreline on the beach. They actually beach themselves uh, to grab a seal. They'll swim out with it and then they'll toss it in the air. And uh, you'll generally find this is a way of training the uh, young. It appears very cruel, uh, but it's, I mean, it's almost like a cat. A cat will find a mouse and he won't just uh, dispatch it. Um, He'll, he'll, he'll chase it around because he can do it all the time. A great white shark, if he lets go of the seal, the seal will swim away. All right. So another question from the chat. Have you ever witnessed birthing or do they birth somewhere else? Have you kept track of a calf? And if yes, for how many years? Okay, no, I've never witnessed a birth. And um, I, I really don't know a lot about the uh, family structures because I'll see a calf and then I'll see that maybe four years I'll, see, I'll, I'll encounter that pod again. So I'm not monitoring the growth or the dynamics 
of the uh, part at all. I can't really answer that. Okay, fantastic. Kylie, now your first question on the collapsed dorsal fin has been addressed. So I'm going to move on from that question, but thank you for the question. Um, just scrolling down quickly. Right, I think we've got most of the questions now. So I am just going to turn back to Modi. Cool. Thanks. So, um, just uh, it was a question I was going to ask, um, but then I saw in the chat that the dorsal fin question came up. But further to that, I mean, surely the dorsal fin does have a function, and the fact that it's fallen down does that impair its, uh, th that function? Or, I mean, are the, is it used sort of for a um, sign, or you know, they, they see each other's dorsal fins to recognize each other, or is it part of the swimming and the fact that it's fallen over the way it has? Does it actually affect its performance as a whale? Well, uh, you know, the dorsal fin would be there to aid the hydrodynamics of the uh, of, of the killer whale when they swim through the water and they and they're uh, chasing prey. They leave very little trace of uh, bubbles behind them, or a wake behind them, or a bow wave in front of them. Uh, so they're very sleek and they're very hydrodynamic. Um, the collapsed dorsal fin clearly hasn't had any impact on important starboard's ability to, to feed themselves, um, but they are off the different prey. Um, maybe a, a killer whale with a collapsed dorsal fin would have difficulty catching a dolphin. It's not something I've considered, uh, but it's certainly, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to induce drag and it's going to make the uh, killer whale more visible to its prey. I was wondering whether when they actually go down under the water, whether the fin straightens out and then just when they come out, because gravity takes its toll, it falls yeah. over. I don't know. No, with port and starboard, it's almost stiff. If, when they're underwater, if you look at most of the uh, killer whales with uh, collapsed dorsal fins, even the ones in captivity, it, it, it's literally rigid in that shape. Okay. Okay, Marty, I'm Thanks. just going to move on for a moment. Um, you're Absolutely. welcome to come back later again. Um, Tebojo, all yours. Um, good evening, and thank you for the wonderful Hello. talk. Thank Please. you. You mentioned that uh, the population may be around 350. Is, is it? Yes. Yeah, that's very much a, a, a guess. Um, you know, these animals are so uh, uh, dynamic in their movement that, uh, you know, until such time as we really, at this stage, as if we've been keeping records since 2009, uh, which in natural history terms is incredibly short. It's just a little blip. So I think maybe as uh, more and more people gather data and uh, more records are created, uh, we'll get a better handle on it. So my estimate is really nothing more than a guess. Tebojo, I'm not sure. From my side, it appears that your screen might have frozen, so we might not have uh, gotten your whole question. But uh, Maret, if you can just keep an eye on her, if she, if she comes back, if we can maybe handle a question um, again if there's any part of it that we haven't um, received. Uh, Koba, please go ahead. Um, thank you very much, Dave, for the presentation. Um, I need to put you on the spot. I gather that okay. you have a passion for the ocean and yes. you have a passion for music, um, judging by the musical instruments in the corner. Um, oh, that's do you part sing... of my talk. <laughs> uh, do you, you sing be, about I the ocean? Be tonight, eh? OK, OK. Yes. You're not going to sing for us tonight. No, no soiree tonight, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> That would have been a first, but but thank you. Thank you for uh, putting Dave on the spot there. Uh, Ruan. Um, I just want to add to something, uh, to Marty's question, well, well, one of his last questions about the dorsal fin. 
and uh, about it being recognized and whatnot. We should always remember that uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, not every single organ or appendage that we have actually has a function. Uh, it doesn't need a function. Um, yeah. It might be some gene that gets expressed. Um, um, and that's really important. Well, it's important to remember. Um, yeah. um, it just, that, that's, uh, that's just from a biological uh, viewpoint. And yes, uh, Dave, I do. I mean, I I'm, I'm completely agree with you. Uh, uh, but uh, it might be, uh, you never know. I mean, there are brothers. It might be some um, genetic uh, mutation. You never know. But um, it is important that we remember that not every single appendage that we have need to have a function um that's just evolutionary biology sorry for um just just i just needed to add that uh, 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 <laughs> so no, I, can't me. <laughs> I can't agree with you there but i feel a uh, dorsal fin like on a shark and uh, other animals acts the same as a keel would on a boat it'll give lateral <laughs> stability well, no, 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 definitely, definitely. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, yeah, I should have been more clear. Be it's not, a, it's not more, I'm not talking about function, but no. uh, more of recognition that, uh, 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 that Marty was speaking about. So functionally, yes, of course, definitely, without any doubt, especially the dorsal fin uh, um, um, in any of the marine animals. But um function wise uh, as regard to well, with regards to anything or recognition or something like that it might That's be right. something completely different thank you very much thanks ron um kaylee now i've uh, i'm going to address another question from you you also unmuted so if you would like to come in and and, and chat and uh, chat with dave you are welcome um your question at the moment is I've seen some recordings on National Geographic about some orcas that almost beach themselves to catch prey. Do you think the orcas in Cape Town will come in uh, any closer to shore? Uh, no, they no, they won't. The uh, Patagonian uh, killer whales, this is something, a technique that they've developed over many, many years uh, with hunting seals uh, on, on the beach. They don't do it all the time. Uh, they do it for about three or four months uh, of, of, of the year. Um, I don't think that our killer whales are going to develop that technique here. Uh, something you've always got to remember with an intelligent, long-living um, predator like a, a killer whale is that they've got to be very careful when they change uh, to a prey species that they're not familiar with. Because um, if they go and attack an animal that they don't know how it's going to respond and it bites their eye out or, or, or damages them, uh, that animal is not going to be able to hunt for the rest of its life. So uh, they're very particular about um, what they're going to prey on. And they're also going to allow the uh, matriarch in their pod uh, to train them. They're not going to indiscriminately attack something that they haven't been taught how to uh, predate them. So I've got an important question, another question from Marty, but it's a very important question. So I have to ask you, um, like Dory in Finding Nemo, well, first of all, do you know Dory? And secondly, do you speak well? <laughs> I wish I could speak well. Uh, I, I try not to anthropomorphize the... Uh, uh, the, 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 the animal, no, I don't speak much. Okay, maybe one of these days with some artificial intelligence we'll manage to get this right. Yeah, you know, talking about uh, acoustics and that, that's also something that's hugely, uh, hugely interesting and something we're going to try in a short while is uh, we don't know why Port and Starboard are displacing the sharks. What is a trigger that's making the sharks disappear? And uh, last year, I managed to get hydrophone recordings of Port and Starboard actually communicating with each other. Okay. Uh, and, and this happened at a time where um, I think it was Port was inshore and it obviously found prey. Uh, Starboard was about a half a mile away. And the two of them were almost talking to each other. It was almost like a dinner bell. And then they came together. And at some stage, what we're going to do is play back this uh, vocalization 
uh, to various shark species and see how they react to it. It's kind of an interesting study. Amazing. Um, Leslie, you're most welcome to ask your question. Thank you. Um, that link that Chris put on the chat, is that the contact to go out with Dave in the ship, in the boat? <laughs> Not sure, I haven't seen that link. <laughs> si si Simon's Town Boat Company. That's, that's us, yes. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Hopefully I'll get down there and go out. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Dave, we, uh, we hope that you get quite busy as a result of this talk, um, also assisting with more environmental education. There's nothing like experiencing the real thing. Um, Carlos, uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Can you hear me? Good. Yep. I can. All right. Wonderful presentation, Dave. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. I'm uh, based in Southern California. Um, I work with shark researchers here in the U.S. and South America to compile aerial data, specifically, right. specifically great white shark behaviors. Very good friends with Allison Towner down there. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, are you utilizing drones on your research currently as a primary observation tool or is it secondary? Uh, well, um, Allison is using it more and more. And uh, a, a lot of the scientists are. Um, I'm not a scientist. I host scientists if they want. And when we're filming, obviously, we're using, uh, we're using drones. Uh, but uh, we don't have ongoing research projects. Uh, what we do is if you came to South Africa and you were particularly keen to see something that we could show you, then we would host you and take you out and uh, you would experience it and we would, uh, we would learn from you. But uh, even though I have uh, the Allison's latest uh, paper um, on the uh, Mossel Bay predation, uh, I've co-authored that with her. Uh, so we will get involved in, uh, in, in uh, co-authoring papers, uh, but uh, I'm not a scientist. And, uh, what I like but, about it. I but as a photographer, you are, because I'm not a scientist myself. Yeah. So I find that sometimes because you spend so much time in the field and like in my case, observing sharks, yeah. you you actually know as much as many scientists do about the behavior in order to capture those photos. So um, I, I'd love to go down there and join you someday and, and get the drone program started and get you, you get you're, going. You're absolutely more than welcome. And uh, drones are amazing. Uh, what they uh, can reveal, you know, in, in, in all cetacean species. You know, when we film and look at, say, Brutus whales, for instance, uh, we see them so briefly on the surface, yet uh, they don't dive particularly deep when they're swimming along. And suddenly with a drone, you can see them continually. But uh, why some other scientists is that uh, I can spend 99% of my time observing on water and 1% uh, of the time in the front of a computer as opposed to 90% behind a computer. And well, you do an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks kindly. I have a feeling that Ruan wants to comment on drones. Ruan, <laughs> please go ahead. Um, uh, Carlos, it's an absolutely brilliant question. And Dave, I know what you're going through. But uh, Dave, just to answer, just to add to your question, and apologies for the low light situation, but um, we don't have any electricity in South Africa at the moment in my particular area. So, um, uh, and my inverter uh, clearly does not have enough juice in it to do what it needs to do. Well, well you but, look very uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But um, Carlos, when it comes to drones, um, South Africa has incredibly strict laws to form with them. I, I'm absolutely sure it's the same in the rest of the world. Dave, I mean, you, uh, you can attest to the fact, but when I want to form with a drone as a company, um, in any national park or any marine reserve, and I mean, I mean, that's 40 kilometers from the coast, uh, from any point in the coast of Southern Africa. Uh, just the sheer amount of paperwork that we have to go through um, uh, to just to form with a drone is absolutely staggering. It's, it's, it's really, it's becoming more difficult. It's easier when you're a scientist, but if you are in the um, 
in the forming community like I am, um, it, it's really difficult. It really, really is difficult. South Africa um, is not the easiest place in the world to form with drones. I know Namibia um, has jumped on the bandwagon as well now, but um, it, it gives you a wonderful opportunity that really is missed with all the um, legislation and everything that we have in place in South Africa to form with drones. But that's just my little bit of, of um, jargon. <laughs> I fully agree with you. Uh, it's a nightmare when we've wanted permits for filming with drones. Uh, as it has just been impossible. It's, it's madness, absolute madness. Um, Prof. Liesel van Us, please go ahead. It's wonderful to see your hand up. Um, just to make a comment on, on, the, on the drones, I'm associated with the zoology department, but what I know of um, orcas and the marine, the, the larger marine life is actually a bit scary. Um, just, just back on, on the drone things, is, is currently the situation we're having at universities as well, and that is to start um, getting the policies into place to work with the drones. So, so I think... Uh, for, for it was nice we're going to have the drones but suddenly people are also going overboard with the policies and the implementation of the drones so on the university we have to have somebody with the more or less uh, a license to to fly a um, uh, 474 um, um, airplane so we're uh, getting that oh. into place so now now the really some of the stuff is yeah, it really is some it of really the stuff is. we can understand so so slowly slowly we are adapting to it to get it into place so that we can get the benefit of working with the drones as well. But another comment I want to make, and that now um, connects to um, Carlos' question of coming to South Africa and what Dave is doing, saying none of you are scientists in, in, in training, but what you're doing. And that is actually a discussion that um, Ruan and I have on the background is the importance of citizen sciences. And since we started with unlocking even two years ago, every now and again, it does come up how the public gets involved. So don't underestimate, Dave, the wonderful work you're doing, and Carlos, probably you as well, and the rest of the people in Unlocking as well. The contribution of citizen science is becoming really more and more important. And it's also because of the value of the information that you do get. And it gets, now again, back to you, Dave, of years and years of experience of, of watching these animals. So um, tap yourself on the shoulder and, and keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. There we go, Dave. If you if you got that recommendation from Prof. Liesel from us, it's official. Thank um, you very much. I won't ask for it in writing. <laughs> Marty, please go ahead. Let's try to unmute you. Oh, yeah, that helps. Thanks. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, obviously, my um, comment about Dory and the uh, speaking whale was a joke. But um, do 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 um, do they make the same sort of whale noise that the other whales make, or is it a different sounding noise for their communication? Um, it, it it's different to, but similar to dolphins. You know, dolphins is very much clicks and uh, and, and 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 whistles, uh, whereas killer whales are a very high pitched. Uh, almost like a wine. Uh, it's a pity I, I should have actually got a little bit of, uh, of uh, orca sound to actually uh, play to you. But um, what I would say is uh, go online and, and just Google and listen to a little bit of a uh, clip on, on killer whales. Um, it's different to, to dolphins, uh, but it's very much, you, um, as I said, it's, it, it's like a high-pitched, wine and then it drops to a much lower pitch but uh I, I, I can't replicate it but i'd really recommend you have a look online and, uh, and cool, thanks. Uh, to it there. Audie, thanks a lot um ruan before i turn to you if i may yes. just ask okay. the book um, are you still with us at the moment i know that you fell out while dave was um answering your question so if you would like to uh, ask another question or um if dave can repeat anything for you please uh, raise your hand or we can unmute you um i'm already in uh, thank you 
I'm not sure if I even got uh, half of the answer that Gabe gave um, regarding the, the threats uh, towards the killer whales. <clears throat> um, the 350, is it a good number or, um, or not? Oh, I, my, I'm hearing you very echo. I don't know if uh, Ron or Johan can... I, um, a question is regarding uh, the number 350, the population. Is that a healthy population for the South African coast or is that underpopulated? Okay. Um, you know, killer whales were killed during the whaling era. Uh, that we know, uh, but I'm not quite sure of the extent of whaling on, on, on killer whales and what percentage of the population uh, were decimated. I don't believe it was a high number. So I would say that uh, for killer whales, uh, the population that we've got along our coast uh, would probably represent a good and stable number. Uh -huh. my, in, okay, in, thank you. Um, sorry, one last question. Um, so unlike unlike um, the land, we know that we'd have scavengers and vultures to feed on the prey uh, after it's been killed. Do, have you ever followed as to what happens to, to the dolphin after the killer have fed on it? Well, what would happen is uh, very similar in, uh, in the marine world, in, but instead of the vultures coming from above, it will be <laughs> the, 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 the bottom scavengers uh, on, the, on the ocean floor. So, um, you know, we have had, as I said, what we had last week uh, in Hans Bar with sharks uh, washing ashore. This will happen in shallow water, but in deep water, uh, the carcass will uh, sink to the bottom and all the uh, bottom feeding animals uh, will feed off the uh, remains of the animal and nothing will go to waste. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Tebocha. Thank you for your questions. Uh, Ruan, back to you. Um, just, a, just a quick one, uh, uh, Bocho, Um Just to add to Tebocha's question, Dave, if you don't mind. Um, uh, it all depends on carrying capacity and what the area has to offer. Uh, I mean, um, it, it's it's very difficult for a small area like False Bay. I mean, it might seem colossal to have two major predators, uh, or, or, or top predators um, um, in the area, but that's all just basic biology. Um, but it's a brilliant question. It's a really good question. I really didn't actually in 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 all of the time that we, we try to form them and what what not. So I haven't actually thought about that. But um, it's 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 a really really good question. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to keep that in mind and um, try to uh, get an answer, which makes sense. All right, um, Ruan um, Maret, am I missing any questions in the chat? or on in the room one We've... just came in from carlos again carlos all right okay carlos's question i filmed the dolphin drowned and paraded around by a pool of killer whales they didn't eat it simply killed it my question is how do these whales adapt such unique behaviors from region to region uh, well, if they, they, they're going to eat the food that they traditionally would in those in, in those areas. I'm not sure uh, where those animals were seen killing the dolphins. Was it in South Africa or I think California? Yeah. No, those were in that that dolphin drowned was in the Sea of Cortez. Okay, but right, yeah. particularly for your for the question is you you showed us examples of the orcas not attacking uh, sea lions or seals. Right. Yet that happens all the time here. That's like their primary food here. Absolutely, yeah. It's just interesting how the regions have different behaviors. And, and can those behaviors transfer from one area to another? Uh, I'm, I'm quite sure they can. Cultural transmission is a hallmark of uh, killer whales. 
And uh, you'll find that, and uh, this is something that we were thinking about with uh, suddenly having Port and Starbull being the only culprits for the sharks being predated on uh, since 2014. And now suddenly we've got Starboard and four other killer whales attacking a great white shark. Have they always been doing that? Or has Starboard now taught the other killer whales how to predate on on them. I know killer whales don't like changing their diets, but they are very adaptable. So uh, if their uh, prey source um, had to run out, they are super adaptable and they'll find another prey source. But um, they'd like, or should I say, they always concentrate on the prey that they're most expert at hunting, so they don't damage themselves. Right. Thank you, Dave. Um, if there are no further questions, then Dave, I think we're going to ask you for a, or thank you for a fantastic presentation. In incredibly interesting, fascinating animals um, that you've been studying for years and photographing for years. And it's an abs been an absolute privilege to listen to you tonight, to be the recipient of your um, knowledge that you've collected. Um, thank you so much. And thank you for your time and the preparation that you put into the presentation as well. And next well, time you can see. Johanna, it's been an absolute pleasure and I've uh, really enjoyed uh, talking to you guys and uh, answering your questions and uh, welcome to come and join us. Uh, anything, uh, I cannot guarantee all sightings. <laughs> we see them 10 times. We see them 10 times Come on, Dave. <laughs> and uh, if I could guarantee it, uh, I, 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 I certainly would. But uh, keep in contact with us and uh, we'd love to discuss it further.